This is Tokens. I'm Lee C. Camp. One of the challenges of thinking about the Bible and guns is that the Bible never talks about guns explicitly because it's an ancient text and right. guns are a modern invention. That's Carly Crouch, professor of Old Testament studies at Fuller Theological Seminary. It always seemed clear that uh, relying for your sense of security on a gun was antithetical to Christian life and Christian ethics. And that's Carly's husband, Christopher Hayes, also at Fuller as an associate professor of ancient Near Eastern studies. Today, a discussion I had with them on their soon-to-be-released book of contributed essays entitled God and Guns, The Bible Against American Gun Culture. What you find when you look around on the internet is that if you search on God and guns, primarily what you get is pro-gun rhetoric. Their work seeks to address the nuances of the commonly made tie between American Christianity and gun ownership, the troubling statistics surrounding the epidemic of firearm deaths, and the possibility for nonviolence and alternative thinking in a gun-saturated culture. Fear can lead us down some very dark paths. And so remember that again and again and again, Scripture says, fear not. God is with you. All this coming right up. Christopher B. Hayes is the D. Wilson Moore Associate Professor of Ancient Near Eastern Studies at Fuller Theological Seminary. Carly Crouch is the David Allen Hubbard Professor of Old Testament Studies, also at Fuller Theological Seminary. Together they edited God and Guns, the Bible Against American Gun Culture. Welcome, Chris and Carly. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. It's great to have you. Talking to you in your home there in Pasadena, California, is that right? That's right. How's the weather so far this summer for you in California? It it is very hot this week. (laughs) (laughs) After a cool, rainy spring, summer is definitely here. I'm happy for you that you had a rainy spring, at least. That's not always the case there, is it? It was the May gray this year. Very gray. What are some of your favorite things to do there in Southern California as far as getting out and about? It's a little hard to remember these days. Um, <laughs> yeah, you haven't been able to, especially with Southern California lockdown so tight. I guess you haven't gotten out a whole lot in the last uh, 18 months, been. have you? Well, I wouldn't want to overstate that. I mean, yeah. we, we managed to keep our sanity by doing some hiking here in the mountains just north of Pasadena that we always enjoy. We learned to swim laps for the first time in our lives. Huh. So, and been out to the beach a few times, which is right. always yeah. one of the lovely things of the California coastline. So yes. we've we yeah, found yeah. ways to, to get outside and stay sane. Yeah, very good. Well, I have uh, a good number of friends in uh, Malibu at Pepperdine that I get out to see every now and then. My oldest son's a Pepperdine grad, and so we've spent a lot of time on that campus through the years. I don't know how people get work done on that campus. It's so gorgeous, I, know, I would think you'd be very distracted. <laughs> it would seem that they would just have to get hardened to the beauty of it. and uh, <laughs> Spoiled, I think I, the word is. That's right. Spoiled, that's right. They'll probably have to spend a little more time in purgatory just because they got to spend all that time in Malibu. (laughs) Well, I'm uh, delighted. I I guess maybe I should make it clear for our listeners that uh, you all are in the same room and you happen to share the same house, I think, because you're married. That's correct. correct? Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you both being Old Testament professors, I think I want to start there and start with the assumed dichotomy that's often posed between the Old Testament and New Testament, that very often this kind of division between Old Testament and New Testament, Old Testament is the God of war and holy war, and New Testament's the God of peace revealed in Jesus. And of course, we have the Martianite heresy early in the early church that kind of propagated some of that sort of thinking. But you all seem to be making the case that actually there's perhaps more continuity between the Hebrew Bible on issues of peace or peaceableness and the New Testament than is often presumed. Uh, Yes, that's certainly right. And quite apart from this book, that's one of the first points that we both cover in our Old Testament introduction courses. Hmm. Yes, that's right. I also teach an Old Testament ethics course with my students where this is one of the things that we often talk about, that they very frequently come to the Bible with this kind of dichotomy in mind. And as we work with the Hebrew Bible texts, with the Old Testament texts, 
opening their eyes to the realization that again and again, also in the Old Testament, there's this deep concern with humanity's tendency towards violence and with thinking about ways in which that might be appropriately restrained and exploring often the very negative effects that those tendencies will have on both individuals and families, but also on the wider community. Those are uh, amongst the issues that we've ended up drawing attention to in this volume, the way that issues around gun violence go beyond just the individual and personal consequences um, of gun violence in the United States and are having this profound impact on our society as a whole. I have a lecture that brings this into focus, the Old Testament versus New Testament stereotype that students, as Carly said, often come in with. And it just pulls out some quotes from both Testaments. You have in the Old Testament, the Lord is a God of mercy and abounding steadfast love unto the thousandth generation, etc. You have you know, beating swords into plowshares, and God is a mother, God is a you know, wing protector, etc. And then in the New Testament, by contrast, you also have quite a few images of the sheep and the goats and you know, people being cast into the outer darkness and, and the lake of fire. And so it's not just a one-way street. It's not just that there's a lot of grace in the Old Testament. It's also that the New Testament, as our co-contributor Shelley Matthews points out, is also a text that can be exploited for you know, violent ends if you go to the right text. So you know, that's not to make a case for or against the Bible as a source of ethical reflection. It's just to say that it takes thought in our own times to know how to use it wisely, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it certainly seemed to me as I started digging into some of that years ago, how one, I don't think can make sense of the peaceableness or the peacemaking of Jesus apart from especially the Hebrew prophets in the sense that they're constantly setting up this kind of expectation of, as you said there, Chris, you know, swords being beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks and the nations shall learn war no more. And that Jesus then seems to be building upon and fulfilling this expectation that's set forward very, very clearly by the Hebrew prophets. And that if we separate that as a narrative, then it seems that we're missing something very significant about what's going on there. I do think it's fair to say that in the course of the Old Testament, you get some of the later texts or at least some of the later stories in the narrative that reflect, I think, more of a seasoned perspective, if you will, when the nation has gone through its own destruction at the hands of the Babylonians. It's in the wake of that in particular that I, I think you start to see more text reflecting on what it means to coexist peaceably. It's not entirely a late theme, but if you look at the conquest traditions as Brent Strawn does in our book, these are troubling texts and the nation comes out and fights for its place in the world in a way that we wouldn't have the Old Testament had it not happened. But I think as they looked back on the effects of war some centuries later, things look different to them. Yeah. Well, could you give us perhaps just an overarching summary of the primary thrust or thrusts of your new book, God and Guns? So this is a book that comes out of a longstanding unease that I've had with the role that Christianity plays in supporting gun ownership and thus gun violence in the U.S., and conversely, the ways in which gun ownership has become, in many people's minds, closely associated with Christianity. So going back even 10 years, I was trying to start conversations among the Fuller faculty to try to speak up about this. It's an issue that I, I've been writing about since my college newspaper in, in an op-ed. Mm. And it always seemed, coming out of my background at least, it always seemed clear that relying for your sense of security on a gun was antithetical to Christian life and Christian ethics. And so I have been for some time searching for ways to express that. And you know what you find when you look around on the internet is that if you search on God and guns, which is the title of our book, or the Bible and guns, primarily what you get is pro-gun you know, rhetoric, how you know, you know Jesus tells people to get swords, or he says that he's come to bring the sword, right? And so I had not seen this case made in a very careful way, or I didn't think thought through very well, certainly from the perspective of Bible. There are books out there, and you've talked to Shane Claiborne in the past, that are from a sort of pastoral theological perspective, 
So what, what we were trying to do was to call together a, a group of scholars for this conference who could come and speak to the issue out of real expertise in biblical studies. And I think that that went really well. And we sort of captured this kind of energy as we came together. And that led to the book and, and the essays that are in it. And so what those are meant to do is to resource other theologians who want to work on the issue to think differently about guns and violence and the Bible in various creative ways. So I don't know. We're hoping that this is also read in you know, church Bible studies and has a mass market. But I, I do think that at the very least, at the level of theological reflection, this is going to give people some new ideas to work with. One of the challenges of thinking about the Bible and guns, and gun ownership and gun violence, of course, is that the Bible never talks about guns explicitly because it's you know, an ancient text and right. <laughs> guns are a modern invention. And so one of the things we were hoping to do with the conference and with this volume in bringing together these biblical experts who are accustomed to thinking creatively about how we translate ancient texts into modern contexts, how we help the church and Christians to bridge some of those gaps as we think about how the Bible might be a resource for thinking about the way we live today in the 21st century. And so asking our contributors to the conference and then the volume to think about with scripture, which does not talk about guns explicitly, how might nevertheless the resources that are there within scripture help us as Christians to think carefully and thoughtfully and creatively about what scripture might say to the question of the role of guns in the contemporary world. It's a real challenge because not only does the Bible not talk about guns, but the Bible is a diverse collection of literature. And so it doesn't have just one perspective on the things. And, it, and I think that to interpret it well for our own times means understanding the entire scope of, of the history of its composition and formation. It's to know who these authors were and who they were speaking to and why and what the theological and, and social and cultural forces of their times were. So I, I think that there's a fair amount of sort of proof texting out there. Aha. Here, yeah. Here's the verse that shows that you know I should do this, and that's almost never the right approach to right. interpreting the Bible. <laughs> so you know, hopefully, we can press it deeper on this conversation. Right. So, what would be some of the uh, key theological resources or themes that get developed in this volume that point toward at least a tension with the prevailing assumption about celebrating guns in American Christian culture? One of the thorough lines that strikes me in a number of these essays has to do with the use and misuse of power mm. and the various ways in which different parts of the scriptural tradition draw our attention to the danger that comes with, whether as an individual or as a community, we abuse the power that comes available to us. So, so for example, Chris talks about in the book of Isaiah, where the prophet castigates the king in Jerusalem for trusting in his own power and in human power rather than in faith and trust in God. Tracy Lamoche talks about the way that biblical tradition draws attention to and then often undermines or calls into question attempts to rely on military strength as the end-all and be-all of what it means to be human. Yolanda Norton draws attention to the episode of Ritzpah's Lament in Second Samuel, which looks at a particular case of David's abuse of power in exercise of violence and draws our attention to the way that the biblical text draws that into question. So a number of the different essays, I think, are drawing our attention to ways in which this biblical tradition of mindfulness to the danger of power can help us think carefully about the kind of power that is arrogated to us as if we own a gun. You know, Dave Linscombe's the final essay in the volume addresses that question very explicitly in the end. Can a Christian own a gun? And one of the things that Dave considers there is what happens to a person when, by virtue of owning a gun, they can instantaneously kill another human being, that they have that power in a way that is not a, 
a natural extension of the human condition. And the way in which the tools that we use also shape us, that we are formed by the types of power that we have access to. And so that's a powerful give and take in that case. Carl, as you were talking there about abuse of power, I, I was imagining hearing some ardent proponent of uh, Second Amendment rights saying, well, it's precisely because of that concern with the abuse of power and abuse of those in power that we have the right to bear arms. How might you respond to someone who might push back in that way? Sure. Yeah. Actually, my essay is one that takes on that topic in a pretty focused way. It notes at the outset that self-defense is by far, especially among women, the highest reason given in polls for why people own a gun or, or want to own a gun. And it's been a powerful motivator. My essay is about this case in the year 701 BC in Judah, where the king, Hezekiah, is trying to prepare for this onslaught of the Neo-Assyrian Empire there on the way to come and lay siege. And so over a couple of years, he does all of this work on the city and you know, he builds more water features for the city so that they're safe in a siege. But one of the things he does is to build larger walls so that he can fit more of the population inside the city protected. It's an act of self-defense. And it works in a sense in the end. Uh, the city does survive that siege. You know, they may have paid off the Assyrians, but they didn't get actually destroyed as they were some century later. And so you, you might expect that a, a prophet who believed that God wanted Jerusalem defended, which Isaiah certainly did, would have been thrilled that Hezekiah built this wall. Instead, in the chapter that I talk about, he condemns Hezekiah because in the process, he, he's torn down some people's houses to build the new wall, which he views as a as a violation of, of social justice and thinks that Hezekiah has gotten himself into this position through mismanagement. So what I'm trying to combat there is this notion that self-defense means that God always wants us to do every single practical thing, whether or not it's just for the sake of our own self-defense. Mm -hmm. And I end with, with the story of Christian de Chergé, who's this really powerful story, a monk in Algeria who is living in a, a majority Muslim country in a time of strife and unrest. And he foresees that he's going to get killed in this situation. And so about two years before he dies, he writes this letter to the unknown man who will kill him. And mm -hmm. he says, you know, basically, I forgive you, my brother. But he still lives there to the end in his monastery, knowing that he'll die as a form of Christian witness. And that to me is, is a kind of Christ-like example for those who really want to know what, what kind of Christian witness God wants vis-a-vis -vis violence. It's a very hard standard, just like Christ himself was, to live up to. But I, I think that the idea that we're called to self-defense in all situations is perhaps misguided. pretty sure that I was reading this 20 years ago, so I'm, I'm pulling out from a long way back. But as I recollect, Martin Luther did not defend the right to self-defense, personal self-defense. He actually was an advocate of the justifiable war tradition, that there are cases in which it's legitimate for the powers that be to make war under you know limited sets of circumstances. But as I recollect, he did not permit the right of self-defense because, again, as I remember, he indicated that this showed too large a attachment to one's own life, mm -hmm. and that instead one needed to honor the promises of God and trust God. And, and so it's, it's remarkable that so often what happens in American culture, I think, is that we argue from the obvious legitimacy of the right to self-defense to something like the just war tradition, whereas in the 16th century, it was turned upside down so far as that's concerned. What do you do with the sort of notion that I mean, I, I would speculate that many people would hear what both of you have said about the Hebrew prophets and would say, well, that's all nice and quaint, but that's just completely irrelevant. You know, th this notion that we would trust God in this way for our defense seems completely irrelevant to the real world. So what might you do with that sort of pushback? Well, I would say two things. I would say first that the Bible comes out of the real world. And so stories like the ones that we're working with were in fact 
existential for real people at a certain time and human nature and human circumstances haven't actually changed that much over 3000 years. So that's maybe the first thing I would say. And then, you know, by telling a story like the one of, of the Algerian monk, this is something that happened in the last few decades. So it's not from a, a different world from ours. And there are, are in fact people who live this way all the time. I mean, I'm sure that we can all think of people who live in parts of even this country in you know, cities or areas that have more gun violence than some who choose not to own guns in their house. That's one of my calls in the chapter is that there are just simply by not having a gun. I think that's a statement of faith in a case where you, you can imagine in some scenario wanting one. I would add also to turn the question a little bit around to draw attention to the fact that owning a gun is increasingly being recognized as a public health crisis, that you are actually more likely to die from gun violence if you own a gun than if you do not. And the statistical odds are quite high. Especially um, when you count suicides, which are yeah, one of the leading exactly, causes of gun Exactly, especially when you death. count suicides. I think it's worth being explicit that the risks and the dangers and the consequences of gun ownership and gun violence cuts across American society. So particular manifestations of gun violence are often associated with the inner cities, or we talk about mass shootings in workplaces or in schools, much less talked about, but nevertheless, a very significant proportion of gun deaths each year are suicides. Because of the prevalence of guns in American culture, their consequences are absolutely pervasive throughout the entire society, regardless of class, of race, of social context. And so this is really an issue where community and our responsibility to each other as members of a community is absolutely central to the question. As Americans, we tend to be raised in a highly individualistic way of thinking and way of being. One of the things that the biblical tradition presses us against is that kind of individualism. And it can often, in fact, be one of the more challenging things for students of the Bible to wrap their heads around, especially those raised in these Western traditions of heightened individualism. So maybe to summarize then, a response to that would be someone pushing back and saying these critiques of gun culture are simply unrealistic. They don't take seriously the real world. I hear you, Carly, saying, no, as a matter of fact, your refusal to take seriously the sociological studies about gun violence is a refusal to take seriously the real world. Yeah, that would be a good summary. You're listening to Tokens, Public Theology, Human Flourishing, and the Good Life, and we are most grateful to have you joining us. If you've not yet done so, please subscribe today to the Tokens Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And we do love hearing from you, at least most of you, and are always pleased to hear some of the things you'd like to hear more about. You can email us at podcast at tokenshow.com. Also remember, you can sign up for our email list or find out how to join us for a live event all at tokenshow.com. Dot com. If you're within a day's drive of Nashville, we would love for you to come in. And we kind of promise it'd probably be worth the drive of a day's trip. We would love to have you join us. This is our interview with Christopher Hayes and Carly Crouch on their new book, God and Guns, The Bible Against American Gun Culture. Coming up, we'll hear more from them about the troubling realities surrounding the epidemic of gun violence in America and the possibility of bringing such troubling realities into the light of conversation as a potential proxy for change and hope. Part two, in just a moment. You're listening to Tokens and our interview with Christopher Hayes and Carly Crouch. Other surprising statistics that you all have discovered about the reality of guns in American culture? Surprising? Are they surprising? Or surprising are, are, are or troubling? Pretty, or <laughs> pretty bleak, yeah. <laughs> pretty horrifying. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just you know, first of all, that they're still on the rise. I mean, you sometimes hear about less murders in the U.S. in certain you know major cities over the years, but in the country as a whole, the number of gun deaths is rising in the, in the midst of the pandemic. I think particularly the rate of suicide w with guns went way up, and the mm. uh, preliminary data on, on 2021 suggested it's going to be up again for overall 
gun deaths and gun injuries. It's not, I think, a complicated scenario that as we pump more guns into the culture, this creates more death and violence. And so this idea that, you know, at some point we're going to get to the right number of guns to make us safer is just a complete myth. (laughs) Chris, it may have been you that I heard online talking about how there seems to be a sort of cyclical nature to this, right? That as our society experiences more violence or more mass shootings, we have the anticipation that the proper response to that is to get more guns and more guns being in our culture seems then to spiral up yet more of these shootings. It's a vicious cycle. And every mass shooting, there's a spike in gun purchases after it happens. That's one of the most depressing things to me. I mean, I would just think you would run the other way, but people run towards it. Yeah. You asked about most surprising or shocking statistics about gun violence. One of the ones that does stick with me is that firearms are the second leading cause of death for children in the United States. Mm. amongst black children, it's the leading cause of death. Oh. I mean, if we think about our future, we are literally killing our children and destroying our future because of this stubborn insistence on a right to bear arms. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we talked just briefly just now about the risk of suicide. So the stats on that, if you have a gun in the home, your risk of a, a gun suicide the house goes up uh, two and a half times. And if you keep the gun loaded, it goes up more than eight times what the non-gun owning house would have. So I I think that's the sort of, it's the reflexive version of Dave Lincecum's article about how having a gun affects you, how having the power to kill someone else affects you, but also having the power to kill yourself suddenly and irreversibly, not just through, you know, taking a pill overdose where they could, you know, pump your stomach. It's truly epidemic is the word, I guess, right? It is. It's only about 5% of suicides that don't involve a gun that are successful. If a gun's mm. involved, it's more like 85% are successful. Mm. So it's, wow. it's a stark, stark difference. Yeah. What's your take on the relationship between various forms of American Christianity and the support of right to bear arms. There's been a lot of studies, I I presume, upon differences, for example, between mainline Protestants and evangelicals, but any kind of observations about sociological realities as far as Christian faith and pushing for uh, gun ownership? This was one of the fascinating and to me actually more hopeful pieces of information that we learned in the process of reading around this topic for the book there's sociological research that shows that actually it's not so much that serious practicing Christians are more likely to own or believe in the importance of guns, that in fact, people who are sort of, you know, weekly regular parishioners or who who are involved in their churches in significant ways are actually no more likely or or, or less likely than other people to share in this sort of gun ideology. Hmm. And so what you have are uh, instead, I think are sort of self-identified cultural Christians who are perhaps less engaged with the actual church on the ground in the pews, but who would call themselves usually evangelical Christians, but for whom their real self-identity is is based around this culture of of hyper-masculine violence. And it's white men are the most prominent in this group. So it was nice to know that the, you know, the correlation between actual Christian practice and gun ideology was not quite so strong for me. Was that surprising to you, that finding? I didn't know how to assess it. You know, I could talk just a little bit about my background. I mean, my, my grandfather was an Oklahoma part-time rancher and he kept a case in the house, in the living room, this nice wooden glass fronted case that was full of long guns. I'm sure he might have shot a varmint or two on the ranch (laughs) from time to time. So I was not, I mean, I'm not shocked by the presence of guns, but I must say that having been raised by a peace church influenced theologian and an epidemiologist who I think probably already knew the risks of guns when I was Mm. much younger. You know, we didn't have guns in the house and we don't keep guns in the house. And we don't have a lot of conversations with people about this all the time, just in our looser social circles. But 
it's not something that we see. And so when, when we go to say Israel and you see the soldiers walking around in, in the public squares with machine guns, that's still shocking to me to have those in the area. So it's hard for me not living in a subculture among a bunch of PhDs and academics and the like who are probably a little bit less prone to this phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, I was raised in a context in which receiving a 12-gauge shotgun was almost like a rite of passage into adolescence. And I've taught and thought a lot about nonviolence and subscribed to nonviolence, but I still have my beautiful 12-gauge shotgun that I got as a kid. And I'm, I, I love that gun. I'm very proud of that gun. But it it's stuck away, and I don't even have 12-gauge shells in my house that fit that gun. But yeah. nonetheless, I, I do think maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm speculating here, but I would assume in the Southeast we have a much broader accepted gun culture. I don't know that that's true, but I would suspect that that's true. But I'm interested, you noted hyper-masculinity as perhaps more a driving force of some of this than a devoted Christian participation in the life of a local church driving this. What are other sorts of observations about either patriarchy, race, or some sort of militant nationalism? What have you learned or seen about how any one of those three variables might relate to this? Well, quite famously, after Obama was elected, the purchase of guns amongst white Americans went up quite significantly. Now, conversely, over this last year, in the wake of protests, particularly about police brutality in the summer of 2020, 2020 statistics are somewhat atypical, historically speaking, in terms of gun ownership and gun purchase. There have been significant spikes in Black Americans purchasing guns almost always for the first time. One of the open questions uh, at the moment is whether that's going to be a sustained trend or if that is a reflection of a particular historical moment in this country. As far as patriarchy, Shelley Matthews has a passage in her piece of the book where she talks about what it actually meant to be a patriarch in the Greco-Roman world of the New Testament. And she makes the point that in a less structured world, that that actually could carry the power of life and death over the people in the household. And so she argues that part of patriarchy is this notion that you ought to have the power of life and death over your household, you know, people in your town. And, and you see this in turning back to race, with some of the shootings, you see, you know, basically black people who are being stalked either by vigilante citizens or, or sometimes even by the police who are, are then gunned down. And I, it, it's not due process. It is a, a form of hyper masculine and patriarchal views that what it means to have the power to care for your city or, or your subdivision or, or whatever it is, is to have the power to kill people. So that's the further piece of it. So, I mean, one element of anecdotal evidence that seems somewhat in tension with sociological evidence you're pointing to about church participation and pushing back against gun culture is the apparent uptick in churches arming their security teams in response to church shootings. Any kind of observations about the data there? I don't think we have data on how significant or large that trend is or how much it may have gone up in recent years, though certainly we hear these stories as well. I would liken it very much to having a flag in your sanctuary. I mean, it's less of a practical issue, but as a symbolic issue, to have that flag at the front of your sanctuary can symbolize for, for some people a sort of worship of the country or worship of the national ideology rather than you know worship of God. It's a kind of idol in the sanctuary for some people. Howard Wass talks about how he's talking about the history of U.S. Christianity. And of course, unlike Europe, where self-reported Christianity has fallen in the U.S., at least until very recent times, it's been quite strong that most Americans by far call themselves Christians. Howard Wass observes that the God that they're worshiping is actually a sort of American God. And I, I think that part of worshiping the American God, arguably, also involves this sort of gun violence ideology where, you know, we're going to take care of ours. We're, we're going to be packing heat. I mean, we've all seen, you know, Jerry Falwell Jr. waving guns around from the Liberty stage. When we say that the correlation between actual church participation and guns is not so strong, it's still there. It's just 
not as outsized as some of the stats might have you believe. Yeah. So here you are, both of you teaching in kind of one of the nation's flagship seminaries, training young women and young men going into pastoral roles, teaching roles. And just for you personally, what would you say are some of the themes or some of the theological formation that you most want them to carry with them that would relate to these matters? Fear not. It's one of the most repeated phrases throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it seems to me that so much of what we do as individuals, as leaders in our communities, leaders of churches, is often driven by fear, whether it's owning a gun for fear of being robbed or assaulted, whether it is hesitating to preach that sermon out of fear that you might lose your job for upsetting your congregation for speaking that truth, that fear can lead us down some very dark paths. And so to remember that again and again and again, Scripture says, fear not, God is with you. And I think that we both also spend a lot of time trying to get students to question whatever formation they bring in that would lead them to be tribal or nationalistic in their views of what God is doing. So in the Old Testament, we have all these wonderful examples of God's plan. I mean, yes, there is a chosen people. Yes, in most of the texts that you have Judah and Jerusalem as the center of God's people, but it is also very clear that God's plan is bigger. And this is clear from the 8th century prophets onwards. One of my favorite stories, though, is in Joshua 5, where they're on the eve of battle, and Joshua meets this figure outside the camp who turns out to be the angel of the Lord. Uh, but he, he, not knowing this yet, says, whose side are you on, ours or the enemies? And the line that the angel says is quite important. He says, neither, but as the leader of the army of the Lord, I have now come. So we do want to bring across to students that God's purposes are, are bigger than their tribe or their country or even their their family's safety, which is such a hard message to absorb. But to get in line with God's purposes doesn't just mean taking care of your own. Yeah, both of those themes, fear not and rising above one's own tribal identity, seem to be such challenges in the world today. We, we talk on this podcast a lot about courage and the significance of inculcating courage and a willingness to grow. You know, Aristotle's got the line about one becomes courageous by doing courageous deeds. And similarly, one becomes a coward by doing cowardly deeds. The notion that to live according to any of this sort of stuff is going to require great courage, right? It requires a sort of willingness to face our fears and step in some sort of faith that allows us to live differently, I think, in some way. Speaking of the courage, what sorts of courage has it required of you all to talk about these things publicly? And what sorts of response have you gotten? What sort of pushback, if any, have you gotten? Has the practicality of courage and fear not played out for you in dealing with these issues? I think when the book comes out, it's going to be a whole new chapter of this story. But already up to this point, I can tell you that this project has received more scrutiny than any other one that I've done. And I, you know, all of us who work on Bible think of ourselves as treading on holy ground. But it's surprising that I haven't managed to offend much of the public, seemingly, with, (laughs) with, with my biblical scholarship. On the other hand, from the very beginning, when, so, um, years ago, I collaborated with some other Fuller faculty just to post a sort of bunch of columns and things and stats up on the website just on gun violence. And at that time, two things happened. I I had written a public essay. And so the school itself scrutinized us very closely. They they had at that time a staffer whose job was, you know, something in sort of PR management. And so he he really wanted to make it clear that we were not expressing a, a formal Fuller stance on this issue. And so that was one piece of it. And, and then I got phone calls to my office from total strangers who said, you know, I, 
I just want you to know that I, you know, I read your piece and I, I'm connected to Fuller in this way. And we, you know, I think you need to think again in fairly, not actual threats, but definitely very aggressive rhetoric used toward me at that time. This, this just doesn't happen with my Old Testament scholarship. And then in the planning <laughs> uh, of the conference, we also had some concerns, which thankfully nothing happened, but you, you may want to speak about that. Well, as Chris was saying, you know, our usual scholarship may ruffle some feathers amongst our friends and colleagues, but not this wider public. Putting on this conference was a completely different experience than any project or conference either of us had been involved in before. You know, concerns about security, questions from our contributors, questions from the seminary about what preparations we were making, what we were going to do if something happened. Fortunately, nothing mm -hmm. happened, but it, a very different kind of experience that I think reflects just how sacrosanct guns are in much of American culture. Yeah. That if you question their place in American culture, then you are opening yourselves up to criticism, to some quite aggressive pushback, hopefully nothing worse. But it is, It's remarkably ironic that a gathering to talk about practicing greater peaceableness and a lesser reliance upon guns should up the concerns of some that one might receive some sort of dangerous pushback. In the same vein, it's striking to me that at gun shows, you can't bring loaded guns into the show. So if guns made us safer, then why wouldn't they want people carrying loaded guns in a gun show? It seems like maybe they know. Same with, with lawmakers. You can't have a loaded gun in the Capitol buildings, right? And yet they pass laws that there should be loaded guns on college campuses. One issue that seems to need a little bit of attention when we began thinking about nonviolence, I don't necessarily hear you all, and I don't know if any of the contributors in your book are avowed pacifists or adherents to nonviolence. I don't know if you all or any of those contributors would reject, for example, the just war tradition. But it seems to be that that's beside the point for the sake of this book and the sake of the arguments that you're making. Is that a fair thing to say? For me, it's interesting, circling back to a, the comment that you made about Martin Luther earlier, there may be work to be done about how the founding traditions of our various faiths and churches would speak to this issue. For me, when I teach about pacifism and just war traditions, for me, Miroslav Volf, who's now at Yale, one of his early books, Exclusion and Embrace, is the one that I, I really view as a touchstone. So he's coming out of the Balkan conflict where he's working as a pastor and theologian. And so in that conflict, he's seen terrible human suffering and death and destruction and use this as a tragedy. But at the same time, it's a war that was fought to stop unjust suffering. And the point he makes is that war may sometimes seem necessary in the human condition and that we are therefore warranted at times to use war to try to stop suffering, but that we cannot pretend that the war is in God's name. We can't say that. We can't name that because we don't actually know for sure that the violence that we do to try to stop more violence is just or theologically sound. And so he does throw God's ultimate justice on the final judgment. And we as, as Christians have to hope that at the end, that there is something more than just this world. We and the contributors, I think, come out along a bit of a spectrum about how fully pacifist or pragmatic we might be on issues of violence on war, gun ownership and use. We talk in the conclusion to the book that we don't have any illusions that the United States is suddenly going to become a gun and violence for utopia. And we talk about the fact that part of the problem with the current conversation in this country is a failure to recognize that there might be at least some ways to improve the situation that we could all agree on, even if there are some aspects that as yet we can't. Um, unfortunately, where 
the stalemate that the American conversation about gun control, about gun violence has got itself to is that any suggestion, for example, that AK-47s maybe don't belong in the hands of average citizens. We can't even have a conversation about that because that's perceived as somehow the start of a slippery slope. And so we're in this situation where we have this epidemic of gun violence and the proliferation of guns that is so morally abhorrent and practically consequential. And so part of what we're hoping to do in this book is to try to at least begin a conversation amongst Christians in particular, but in society more widely, that there is a conversation to be had here and that that we might be able to begin to make some progress towards a safer and more peaceable community. Are there other signs of hope for you in all this? Stories, exemplars that you look toward as a beacon of possibility? I think we're in a pretty dark moment, if I'm honest. As we mentioned, the sales of guns and gun violence continue to rise. I think the only thing that holds out hope to me right now is just that the conversation is started and is happening in meaningful ways. Your show itself is a meaningful statement, I think, in that regard. And we also, in the book, we end with a whole list of groups and causes that people can get involved with. And so uh, I'm not sure that I would call the need for those hopeful, but there are certainly lots of people talking about this now. I just find myself wondering what the tipping point is going to be if it hasn't been what's already happened, because the levels of violence and death that have already happened strike me as unconscionable. We start the book by calling this a kind of pandemic. And it's just when the COVID pandemic started, I was just so shocked by the difference between our national response to COVID and our national response to guns. Because, you know, COVID certainly, I mean, it's a great tragedy. And the country jumped to change the the entire way that we lived. And I, I support that. I think, you know, keeping people safe was the right goal. I'm just amazed that we don't have any reaction to even higher levels of death from guns. Why are our hearts so hard on this one issue? It's a bit incomprehensible to me. I think it is a dark moment. The statistics of people flocking out to buy more guns in 2020 and into 2021 is a very sobering realization. This year in 2021, we are already well on pace to outstrip even the gun violence deaths in 2020, which were higher than any previous year. And I wonder, like Chris, what will it take to shift the national conversation? It wasn't a mass shooting at an elementary school or at a concert or at a workplace. I'm at a loss to imagine what it might now take to shake us out of our complacency, the, this apparently willing acceptance that thousands, tens of thousands of people will die every year because of this. I've been talking to Chris Hayes and Carly Crouch, both faculty members at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California, editors of God and Guns, the Bible Against American Gun Culture. Thanks so much to both of you for your good work and grateful for your own perseverance in raising these issues for us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure to be with you. You have been listening to Tokens, Public Theology, Human Flourishing, The Good Life, and our interview with Christopher Hayes and Carly Crouch on their new book of contributed essays entitled God and Guns, The Bible Against American Gun Culture. Please visit tokenshow.com slash guns for links to studies, statistics, and groups you might want to learn more about. A lot of great resources there contributed by Professors Hayes and Crouch. If you've not yet subscribed to Token Show, we ask thee, why, oh, why not? Hast thou not thus subscribed? You may do so upon the platform of Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever thou dost receive thine most favorite podcasts. And while I am thusly speaking, though I doth not know why I didst surely begin with the English of King James, and yet now feel pressed down, called forth to continue speaking thusly, 
And so I also say unto thee heartily, if thou hast not freely and profusely with praise given us thy review upon the platform of Apple Podcasts, we say unto thee, why not? Why? Oh, why not tonight? This day, go now, go forth, and be therefore our friend now. Why are you waiting? Our thanks to the Stellar team that makes this podcast possible, executive producer and manager Christy Bragg of Bragg Management, co-producer Jacob Lewis of Great Feeling Studios, associate producers Ashley Bain, Leslie Thompson, Brad Perry, and Tom Anderson, engineer Carriot Harmon, music beds by Zach and Maggie White, and our live event production team at Stonebrook Media, led by Phil Barnett. Thanks for listening, and peace be unto thee. Tokens Podcast is a production of Tokens Media, LLC, and Great Feeling Studios. Oh. <laughs>